Uh, if you're new, um, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a backdrop uh, as you are getting ready to jump into the very end of a year long conversation. So we've been going through the uh, Bible together in the year 2020. 2020 has been the year of the Bible for us. Uh, it's not too late. Uh, you can still jump in with us and uh, continue to read out the New Testament. You can find the link on our website to join our reading plan. We can engage and talk with each other there. Uh, it's really been great to be able to go through the Bible together this year. And I hope that it's been really helpful and edifying for you. I know for some of us, it may be the first time that we've ever gone through the Bible or even attempted to read the whole Bible. And so this series this year has been called Finding Our Place in God's Story. And what we've been trying to do, especially on Sundays, is really trying to see the larger scope of the Bible and how it all fits together, the meta narrative, what the story of the Bible is from beginning to end, and then how do we fit into that story? And so uh, we've worked through the entire Bible uh, and on Sundays, we've kind of worked through like kind of a 30,000 foot flyover of some of the major sections of the Bible. And now for the next several weeks, uh, through the end of the year, we're going to land in the book of Revelation. And so as we jump into this series on the book of Revelation, often called the Apocalypse, I wanted to start out by framing what we're going to be trying to do in this series, okay? And first of all, I just want to admit I am incredibly humbled, and I often feel overwhelmed and ill-equipped to be able to teach and preach on a book such as Revelation. Uh, Revelation can often be very confusing uh, it's often been abused to make all sorts of ridiculous conclusions and predictions. And this book can be particularly difficult for us because it was written so long ago in an ancient culture and time and in a literary style that we're often so unfamiliar with. And so uh, one preacher actually in my studies and research who was once uh, in the past the president of the Southern Baptist Convention he preached to his local congregation for three years through the book of Revelation. He produced a five volume set of books from that series. So this can kind of help give you a scope of what we're trying to dive into here. I'm only doing six sermons, okay? And so clearly I'm not going to even begin to touch the surface of this incredibly rich, dense, multi-layered ancient book of God. So as we begin, I want to kind of like lay out a scope of what we're going to be doing together, okay? Kind of go through the flow of how we're going to approach the book of Revelation together. So the first half, the first three sermons, are actually going to be helping us to frame how we read Revelation. So it's going to be helping us to engage in this particular book and in this particular literary style and kind of give us some frameworks in which how we read Revelation. And then the second half of, uh, of this series is going to be more focused on some relevant themes that come out of the book of Revelation that I think are appropriate for us today. And so obviously um, in our context today, uh, we have just uh, seen the close of the 2020 election as a new president has been elected. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of feelings and opinions and um, some great, some remorseful. Uh, and, and no matter where you stand on the, uh, on the spectrum politically, uh, it's time for us as Christians, as I have been saying all along leading up to this election, starting back to last year, it's time that we make sure that we are in alignment with God's kingdom and that in his worldview, he teaches us to be surrendered to his will and submissive to the authorities that he allows to be in place because we believe that God sovereignly runs the nations and the entire cosmos. And so we're going to see some of those themes actually in the book of Revelation, ironically enough. So what I want to do to begin here is to kind of try to identify some things that I'm not trying to accomplish during this series, okay? So again, all of today is just going to be trying to frame out where are we going, what are we doing, and what are we trying to accomplish, because there is a lot that we could try to accomplish that we're not necessarily going to in the next several weeks. So what I'm not trying to do in this series, I'm not going to try to interpret every aspect of the book of Revelation for you, or tell you what every vision, image, and number in the book means. I am not going to go through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter. 
I'm not necessarily even going to go through it in any particular order. I'm not going to tell you that the book of Revelation makes clear prediction of the end of the world as we know it and what the date is going to be. I am not going to tell you that I completely understand every aspect of the book of Revelation. And I'm pretty sure you don't either. So what am I going to try to do, right? I am going to try to help us learn how to read Revelation responsibly and to learn different interpretive grids and methodologies for this very challenging book. I am going to try to help us learn how to appreciate its literary design and form and function in the context in which it was written. I am going to try to help us understand a bit more about the first century audience, how they likely understood what they read and heard from the revelation of John, so that it can help us understand and apply those things to our context today. And I am likely to offend some people. I might offend you by what I say. I might offend you by something I don't say and that you think I should. I might offend you for a number of reasons. Some of them may be intended and some not. But I want to remember that Jesus offended people too. And if we never offend anyone, we're probably not following Jesus. For he said, woe to you when all men speak well of you. So that means that I'm not necessarily going to go out of my way to try to step on your toes, but please know that if I do, it's not personal, but I want to try to handle this text as best I can. So when we read the Bible, I want us to have some things in mind, in particular when we read the book of Revelation, because now maybe more than ever, it's time to make sure we have a hold tight on our interpretive framework, on how we are engaging the Bible and how we understand interpreting it. Call it a, it's called our hermeneutic. And if you want, go back, to, please, to, to my personal website, johnsherwood.com. You can find a free class there that takes you through a series of how to read the Bible, where I talk about some of these principles much more in depth. It's very accessible. Uh, much, much of the church went through that together last fall. But if you haven't had a chance or you would like to refresh, which I think is very important, please go and check that. But the Bible can never mean what it never meant. The Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. These are important hermeneutical frameworks. These are important uh, uh, ideas that we have firmly in view when we read the Bible, especially the book of Revelation. And what I mean by this when I say that the Bible can never mean what it never meant is that we cannot interpret the Bible to mean something for us today that it never could have meant for the first audience. What God communicated through the people of God, through his spirit to their audience, creates principles that we can extract for our context, but we're never allowed responsibly to make the Bible mean something that it never originally meant. And the reason for that is that the Bible is written for us. We're able to learn and grow and understand God and what he wants for our lives through the Bible, but it wasn't written to us. It wasn't written to, first, uh, to 21st century Americans. It was written to first century uh, Jews and, and Romans and Greeks in the New Testament and obviously ancient uh, Mediterranean civilizations before that. So that makes it very difficult for us, right, to be able to understand what the Bible means for us because we've got to figure out what did it mean for them. And that's where the challenge of responsible interpretation comes and falls upon us. So I want to challenge us as disciples of Jesus to keep learning, keep growing, keep being humble and being taught. I know that this is what I want to do personally. And I want to highly encourage you to check out that class that I mentioned, How to Read the Bible. And there's also some resources there in that class that can really help you in this endeavor. You know, often as disciples, when we're going out to try to make disciples, to help people become Christians, when we're going to make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey, often we're studying the Bible with them. And we start studying the Bible and engaging the scriptures on the topic of salvation. We often start with what does it mean to be right with God, to be forgiven of our sin? What is the basics of the gospel message? 
And often we find people struggling to really be humble and submit to what the word of God says about salvation. Maybe because they've never really looked intently into the scriptures for themselves on that topic. Instead, they've often just taken what the preacher said or what mommy said or what the Christian culture around them has said and done. But they've never really engaged the scriptures intently and vigorously on a topic like salvation. And often when we start doing that together, it can create struggle. It can create challenge, right? And sometimes people are proud and they don't want to hear anything because they've made up their minds, even without studying the scriptures diligently, even on a topic so important and crucial salvation. But I wonder, how many of us as disciples of Jesus do the very same thing with other topics and other parts of the Bible? That after we learn what it means to be saved and forgiven, once we've received salvation and now we're disciples of Christ, we've slowed or come to a complete halt in our attitude of humility to keep learning and keep growing. And let me tell you, Revelation is going to push that attitude because we've got to keep growing and learning. I can guarantee none of us have this book fully figured out. And I have not arrived either. I'm just starting to get my feet wet here and continuing to learn myself, but I want to be humble. I want to be open to the fact that I may not have everything all figured out, no matter what this random podcast told me when I listened to it. So during this series together, Let's try to read the entire book of Revelation in one sitting, at least one time. Maybe listen to it. The more that we can take this work in as it was designed to be taken in, whether you're reading it or hearing it, the more we can do that, the better it will help us to understand and to try to see what it is that John was communicating to his original audience. So try to read through the book of Revelation as many times as you can and try to do it in one sitting or as close to one sitting as you can. This type of engagement with the scriptures helps us to see the work as a whole, which is how it's designed and intended to be read. Oftentimes we have been trained really well in how to dissect the Bible and to pluck verses out of its context and to and, and that's dangerous because that's not how it's designed. It's not a maxim of fortune cookie sentences. That's not what the Bible is. It's a narrative. It's a story compiled of all types of small little miniature stories. And this particular miniature story is, you know, 22 chapters long. And so we want to try to take that in as one piece as much as we can. So what I want to do is go through some of the survey results. Many of you guys filled out a brief survey as I was just trying to get a feel for where people are at with their experience, thoughts, and opinions about the book of Revelation. So I wanted to go through some of these and be able to show you kind of what some of these survey results reveal. So one of the questions was, how many times have you personally read the entire book of Revelation? And so you can see the breakdown here, never 8%, one to two times 38%, three to four times 40%, and five or more times 15%. So you can see that the vast majority, the bulk of people, you know, close to 70, 80% of people have read Revelation one to about four times, right? So not a lot, um, but most people aren't totally unfamiliar with it either. Then we ask the question, how many times have you heard a sermon out of the book of Revelation? 18% said they've never heard one. 23% said they've heard one or two times, 25% three or four sermons, and 35% five or more sermons. It's interesting, right, when we see that. Like, there's actually a, a, the largest single percentage has heard a sermon five or more times out of the book of Revelation, but most people haven't read Revelation that many times. Interesting, right? This can, get, again, go back to this idea that our information is coming from somewhere else, not from us actually reading the text. So I asked, what do you think the main point of the book of Revelation is in one sentence? 17% <laughs> of people said it's about the end times or something along those lines. And I was so grateful and so pleased to see people's honesty. 11% of people said, I have no idea, right? Which is, is very honest and quite real. And I wanted to throw on a couple of honorable mentions here in the survey results. 
What do you think the main point of the book of Revelation in one sentence is? Someone said, I had to Google that one. Another person said it's the return of the king, but not Aragorn, king of Gondor. And I think I might have known who that one was. I thought these were honorable mentions. We asked the question, what do you think is the most popular or well-known thing about Revelation? Again, 28% 28 of people said the end times. And 25% of people said the letters to the churches that happened there in the early part of the, the book. A couple of honorable mentions. What's the most popular thing about Revelation? How the earth gets destroyed. Or, again, no idea. I thought these were good honorable mentions. What's one of the most confusing things to you about Revelation? 36% of people said symbols, imagery, beasts, and numbers. How do we understand all of that stuff? That was by far the clearest thing that was most confusing for so many people. And then 14% of people said everything was confusing about Revelation, which again, I laud the honesty. An honorable mention here, I don't know who is exactly saying what to whom and about what, basically the whole book. Again, I appreciate the candor and it is quite real. So what's one thing that you hope to get out of our time studying Revelation, the survey asked. 70% of people, that is an astronomically high number in surveys, said to better understand and apply the book of Revelation. And that's what I'm hoping to set out to do. That's what I want to get out of our time studying the book of Revelation, personally and collectively, that we can better understand and responsibly apply the book of Revelation. A couple of honorable mentions here. One thing you hope to get out of our time in Revelation, I wanna know what it all means. No pressure, John. <laughs> Thank you very much, I appreciate that. And also, what can we expect for the end of days? And is it now? You know, right after this election, some of you guys might be scratching your heads. So let's try to figure out what this book is all about together over the next many weeks. The first thing that I wanna do as we start this series is I wanna recanonize the book of Revelation. And let me explain what that means. And that is actually the title of today's lesson, the recanonization of Revelation. And the canon is what is known as the compiled scriptures as we have them as the holy canon, the holy set of books that are from God. So when we talk about recanonizing something, we're talking about making it again a part of the canon, a part of what we believe is from God. But I want to talk about why we need to recanonize it. For many Christians, the book of Revelation has been decanonized, meaning that functionally it's in our Bibles, but we don't really treat it like it's from God because we don't really read it. We don't really know what to do with it. We kind of stay away from it. Preachers don't really touch it. In effect, in function, we sort of decanonize it. You know, it's like we, it, it's so odd that we treat it like it's not the inspired word of God. And then for others, for other Christians, the book of Revelation can tend to be hyper canonized, meaning that the book of Revelation gets elevated amongst all the other books, and this becomes the canon within the canon that promotes their views of the end times and is happy hunting grounds for all kinds of bizarre and dangerous interpretations. And so we have to figure out this middle ground between a hyper-canonized book of Revelation and a decanonized book of Revelation. And I think for many of us, we kind of, if I'm right for myself and for many of us, we kind of tend to come more from the decanonized camp. We sort of just leave it alone. We don't really know what to do with it. We read it once or twice and just decided, oh, I'm going to go back to Paul's letters to the Corinthians and, and to Galatians because those make more sense to me. And we've got to recanonize this book, but it takes a lot of work to do that. It is challenging, I will admit, and I often feel very humbled and ill-equipped to try to do this for myself and others. So one of the first things that I want to do to help us recanonize the book of Revelation is to know how to say the name of the book Revelation. You will notice that all throughout this series, I never say Revelations because there was only one Revelation of John. Every single teacher I have heard or read on this subject matter all make this point. Apparently, there is a pandemic 
of getting the book's name wrong. Apparently, Revelations in English entered in somewhere along the way, and we all call it Revelations. It's just Revelation. So now that we've got that out of the way, and you know how to say the name of the book, I also wanted to give you a recommended reading list. Um, and I'm going to do that in just a moment, a more thorough one. I forgot to have my book on set, so hold on. The primary book that I want to recommend is actually called Reading Revelation Responsibly by Michael Gorman. This would actually be probably the place that I would point most people to first. It might feel a little academic to some. I would encourage you to push through, but this is an incredible book that's going to be a basic overview and help you really understand how to engage this book in a responsible way. And uh, I'm going to be pulling uh, a lot from Gorman over this series and, and many others, Bachman too. Um, but I, I do want you guys to have some places and really encourage you, please do some of this work on your own. See my previous slide about let's make sure that we're still learning and growing and humbly seeking like Bereans as Christians and not just relying on the few convictions that we got in our first principle studies. Okay, so this is a couple of quotes that I wanted to mention to frame this idea of how do we read Revelation responsibly, right? And Gorman says, which I think is very helpful, responsible engagement with Revelation ultimately pays attention to Revelation's theological message as a word from God for the 21st century that is analogous to what its message was for the first century. Let me read that again to you. Responsible engagement with Revelation, and I would say the entire Bible, ultimately pays attention to Revelation's theological message as a word to God for us, but it has to be analogous or in line with what its message was for the first audience, right? This goes back to the idea of the Bible can never mean for us what it never meant for them. Contrary to popular belief, Gorman says, Revelation is not about the Antichrist, but about the living Christ. It is not about the rapture out of this world, but faithful discipleship in this world. So when we read it, we've got to ask ourselves, can Revelation even be understood? Is it good news or bad news? Is it about the new heaven and the new earth, or is it about the Antichrist and the lake of fire and the destruction of thousand years? Is it primarily about Christ or is it about the Antichrist? Does it concern the past or right now or sometime in the future? Does it intend to instill fear or faith? Is it primarily about judgment or hope? Is it about a particular evil empire, whether past, present, or future, or about evil and empire more generally? I want to answer yes. It is about all of those things. And as the book of Revelation covers all of these many, many topics, we've got to understand that it is a rich, thick text with multiple layers of meaning. And Gorman actually puts forth this definition of what the book of Revelation is that I think is quite helpful. I think it's a good definition. He says, the book of Revelation is primarily good news about Christ, the Lamb of God, who shares God's throne and who is the key to the past, present, and future, and therefore also is the key about uncompromising faithfulness, leading to undying hope, even in the midst of unrelenting evil and oppressive empire. I think that's a great working definition for the book of Revelation. And if you look with me in chapter 1, verse 1, we'll read the very opening line of the book of Revelation. It says, the revelation or the apocalypse from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what soon must take place. The very opening line tells us that this is a revelation of or from Jesus Christ, that you, depending on which version you're reading, you'll see that Greek translated either of or from. It could mean either one. Um, and so this book is letting us know in the first several words that this is an apocalypse, a revelation. We're going to talk more about what a, an apocalypse is, what apocalypse means, and how to read apocalyptic literature in our next session. But it tells us right from the jump, this is about Jesus Christ. 
it's not primarily a book about the end of the world. And so as we get ready to continue on in our conversation next week, as we get ready to dive into apocalyptic literature and how to understand what apocalypsis is in Greek, I think this is going to help us as we learn how to engage this rich, multi-layered text that often can be weird and freak us out. Just put on your seatbelt and just know you're going to be weirded out. It's okay. You're going to be confused. You're going to not know what to make of certain things. That's okay. It's okay. Don't get weirded out. Don't let that discourage you. Don't let that, don't let that get you to stop. Let's just keep moving forward and doing the best we can. And so a couple of tips as we get ready to close out here in a moment, a couple of tips that I think can help us as we read and interpret Revelation, as we go through this series together, hopefully as we read the book of Revelation or listen to it multiple times over the next couple of months, I want us to, to, to remember to read it as a unit, right? Listen and read to Revelation as a unit in one sitting, if possible. If that's going to help us grasp John and his first century's uh, first century audience's perspective better. This is a big one. We got to watch out for the Old Testament, right? Revelation does not start to unfurl itself unless we really are in touch with the Old Testament, which in my opinion, I think is why it's often so difficult for us as 21st century Christian Americans, because often we are not familiar with the Old Testament. But John alludes to and quotes from the Old Testament more than any other New Testament book by far. So we've got to make sure that we understand the Old Testament and its context and that we give those passages their weight in order to help us interpret John's allusions to them. This is why studying the Bible is a lifelong process because you look at that and you go, wait, I can't really understand the last book of the Bible very well until I understand all that. Yeah, it's a lifelong process. Another thing that we want to remember, a tip to remember while we're reading Revelation is that it is for every generation and era. Treat Revelation as a book that's designed to engender faithfulness for God's people, hope and courage for them in the church for every generation and in every era. And don't squeeze too hard. If we overly squeeze symbols and imagery trying to make them mean something that they don't, we can run into some dangerous interpretations and conclusions. And be careful that we don't squeeze too hard on these images and symbols and visions while overlooking the very clear moral mandates and the worship and liturgical focus throughout the book of Revelation. If you would like some materials, here are some resources that I would highly recommend. Again, Michael Gorman's Reading Revelation Responsibly. Uh, the Bible Project, which has been part of what's been going through our 2020 year of the Bible, is we've been watching their thematic uh, books of the Bible videos going through each of the books. They have a great podcast series, seven or eight episodes long, maybe, on the book of Revelation. I would highly recommend that. It's engaging. It's helpful. I think it's really, really good. And then, um, you know, Gordon Ferguson, who's a brother and a Bible teacher in our fellowship, he wrote Revelation Revealed. Uh, I actually have a couple of copies of those. I was hoping to be able to give them out. We're not yet meeting in person. So if you'd like one, hit me up. That's going to be a really easy introductory place to start. Um, and then if you're looking for something a bit more weighty or heady, maybe you've been studying Revelation for a while, I would highly recommend Richard Bachman's book, The Theology of the Book of Revelation, which is a truncated version of his massive tome, The Climax of All Prophecy. So if you have any questions or maybe you want to recommend some other resources that you have found helpful, please let me know and we will continue to try to get the word out because we want to learn together in a community, how do we make sense of this revelation of Jesus Christ? Thank you, guys. I look forward to moving together uh, in the next coming weeks through this book. And may God use our time as we open up his word to bring us closer to him and to provide a faithful steadfastness and courage in the midst of very difficult, evil empire times.